It's wonderful to be here and know that Jesus is here. It's wonderful to see Sister Tracy here with us today. We don't get to see near as much of her. And, and Loretta, we haven't, haven't seen for a while, and it's wonderful to see her back with us. Ken, it's wonderful to see you back there. We were kind of worried about you last week, brother. So, and Mike Pack as well. So it's, it's wonderful to be here. Amen. Jesus is here. We're here. Amen. Wonderful day. Now we've been studying the section of the Sermon on the Mount called the Beatitudes. And we've gone through the first two of those. And we've learned that the Beatitudes use are all about faith. Okay? And how to develop that faith. We'll finish the section about how faith begins today. We learned about being poor in spirit in verse 3. And we learned about mourning our sins in verse 4. Today we're going to discuss what it means to be meek. You know, when I just started reading the Bible for myself and not going to church and stuff, I thought maybe that meek meant, you know, the Chinese because they were always... But no, that's not what they're talking about. They're not talking about a meek misdemeanor. Misdem What is forget? Because I've already forgot what that word is. So, huh? Disposition. Yeah, that's what it was. A disdemeanor, huh? I just <laughs> looked that up later. In the future, if the Lord is willing, we're going to study about how faith develops in verse 6 and how faith matures in verses 7 through 9 and how faith is tested in verses 10 through 12. So looking at faith how faith begins, we're going to first focus first on the first three of the Beatitudes. The poor in spirit, the mourners, and the meek. Matthew 5, 3 said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the poor spirit is the man who sees that there is a God, who then sees himself in perspective to God, and he sees his nothingness before God. In Matthew 5, 4, it says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Those who mourn realize their true situation, how sin has ruined, ruined them. They, they mourn for themselves and for the entire world. And both of these are essential to the beginning of faith. You have to feel bad for what has come before and what's been allowed to happen before. That's the mourning part. Okay? For they are at the heart of what turns us away from our self-reliance and toward our trust in God. So remember, we're talking about the beginning of faith here. In Habakkuk 2, 4, it says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Okay? That's what we have to do. Meekness, then, is essential to true living. If we're going to experience the kind of life God desires for us, then we must learn how to apply these characteristics to our lives. Let's look at what uh, Nelson's Bible Dictionary defines meekness as an attitude of humility toward God and gentleness toward men, springing from a recognition that God is in control. Amen? Amen. Although weakness and meekness may look similar, they are not the same thing. Being meek is not being weak. Weakness is due to negative circumstances, such as a lack of strength or a lack of courage. Okay? But meekness is due to a person's conscience choice. It is strength and courage under control, coupled with kindness. Perhaps the last sentence is, is the best idea of strength and power under control, coupled with kindness. It is never weakness or fearfulness. I repeat, it is never weakness or fearfulness. If we look at other definitions of the word, word meek, we find it's used to describe a soothing medicine, 
It's used by sailors to describe a gentle breeze. I know personally that even a gentle breeze still has the power to move a ship. It's used by horsemen to describe a broken colt. All three of these are examples of great power under control. Meekness is the ability not to take up arms against the evil in the world, but to patiently wait on God. Psalms 37, 8 through 11 tells us, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, those, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Other passages that encourage, encourage meekness are Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Galatians 5, 22, Ephesians 4, 1. I can go on. But there's many others as well. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn, f- learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Galatians 5, 22 t- tells us that we can never go wrong by living in meekness, as, as we see in verses 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. In other words, you're free to practice all of those all you want. <laughs> so let's be sure and do that. Ephesians 4, verses 1 and 2 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. Colossians 3.12, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels, okay, that means deep inside, deeply, okay, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and long-suffering. You need to feel that meekness deep within. That's what it's telling us here. It's not telling anything to do with anything else. I know it's easy to confuse. 1 Timothy 6.11 says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. I'm really loading you up with the verses here. <laughs> 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25 says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Meekness is vital. Titus 3, 1 and 2, To speak evil of no man and to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. So what does meekness have to do with faith? Remember, meekness allows poor in spirit, or follows poor in spirit, and mourning. This is the one who has already recognized his own emptiness and needs to fall at God's feet. If you're meek, you recognize your own emptiness. You recognize you can't go forward without God. You recognize you need him in your life, and you don't want to be separated from him. That's, that's where that meekness comes from. This is the one who's already recognized that emptiness. Okay? This is the one who has already felt to the core of their being the shame and disgrace of their own sin. And the sins of the whole world and mourn deeply for the consequences. Okay? So it was those first two steps that lead us to meekness and The meekness follows as we're in preparation to follow the faith. The meek is now the one who realizes that he personally has nothing with which to fight the world. He has nothing that can subdue it or overcome it. 
on his own. He has one thing, God. The meek still have power. Okay? They can fight. They can rebel. They can stir up a fuss. But instead, they now harness that power and use it under the direction of God. They acknowledge that he is in control. Meekness is an essential quality that finally and completely causes a person to believe in, trust, depend on, and obey God. Does one give up power to become meek? You know, lots of medicines are made from lethal substances. Realize that? What about warfare? You know what that is? It's rat poison. But used in small amounts, it'll thin our blood and stave off a heart attack. Under control. It's a very strong medicine used under control. Okay. Does the medicine give up power to cure the sick? Is it still a lethal medicine? Yes. It hasn't given up any of its power, but it has the power to cure the sick when used in a controlled way. Does the wind give up power to push that ship across the sea? Or does it use its power in a controlled way? Okay. It's controlled. Does the horse give up power when broken to ride? Or does it use its power in a controlled way? This magnificent animal gives over its powerful muscles to its master most of the time. I mean, you know, there are some plow horses out there that'll pretty much plow the row for you. And there's some saddle horses out there that'll pretty much plow the row with you. You know. But a well trained horse that gives over to its master is a joy to behold. Amen. It's one of the strongest mammals on earth. But yet, through love. It'll let you do almost anything with it if you've trained it properly, if you've taught it properly. It's amazing. Neither does a man give up his power when he becomes meek. He uses his power under God's control. He accomplishes what is good and productive instead of causing harm and destruction. He looks to do that. He knows he is not the answer. God is the answer. So he's willing to be used by God. He doesn't need to overcome or overwhelm, for he knows that God will do all of that for him. If something really needs taken care of, doesn't God take care of it for us? Doesn't he prepare our way? Doesn't he look after us while we're laying there at the feet helpless? Yeah. God looks over us and prepares the world in our life for us. If we'll just be that meek person, accept that training. They shall inherit the earth, it says. The meek are happy or blessed because of the fulfillment of the Lord's promise that they shall inherit the earth. We know that God's people will inherit a new earth, don't we? Second Peter 3.13 tells us, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, Look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Through that meekness we do that. 313 speaks of heaven, but the promise that Jesus makes here in Matthew 5.5 5 comes in, in this present world, doesn't it? Jesus wants us to understand that only the meek will enjoy the abundant <laughs> blessings of God in this life. It, we must give ourselves over to God to receive those blessings. All worthwhile things in this world are in the possession of the meek. Things like love and friendship. We have a lot of that here. The meek are able to enjoy the best that others have to offer because they're able to give their best to others. I'm going to read that one over. The meek are able to enjoy the best that others have to offer because they are able to give their best to others. 
The first three Beatitudes fit together to form this beginning of faith. The poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek. Each of these is important in turning us away from ourselves and turning us towards God. Without them, faith cannot truly begin. So how's your faith? It could be that the answer is found in how well these characteristics are rooted in your life. They help us answer the question of who are we depending on? How's your faith? It could be that the answer is found in... I just read that. The path to salvation, though, is a personal one. And you can do it for your mom, your dad, or your children. You just cannot do that. You can only do it for you. It's between you and Jesus. Have you become meek for Jesus? You know, part of meekness is sharing love among the brethren and among each other. And, uh, boy, it's hot up here. <laughs> And uh, so you should always strive to be that giving and accepting. Okay? When you realize that you are as far down as you can get, God is so much more wonderful than you are, and he's standing there waiting to give you his blessings all through life. And these three, first three verses of the Beatitudes are preparing you to accept that faith in your life. And it's hard. It's hard. You know? And it is. Between you and Jesus, have you given yourself over to Him? Are you meek in all that you do? Do, do you act out of love with those around you? Remember, Jesus is your Savior. And He's been waiting for you if you haven't given yourself to Him already. He's waiting for you to hear the word of God. He's waiting for you to react to hearing that word of God. He's waiting for you to believe and have faith in the word of God. Christ is waiting for you to repent of your sins. That turning away from your previous lifestyle and choosing God's way, as it says in Acts 1 verse 30, Christ is waiting for you to confess your faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. As it says in Romans 10, 9 through 10, Christ is waiting for you to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, as it says in Acts 2, 38, and for you to live a life faithfully as a Christian, as it says in 1 Peter 2, 9. That's a big demand, and you can't do it for anybody else. You can only do it for you because it's what God has asked you to do. But the one thing we need to do is bring all of the people we can to this realization. Okay? We need to let other people experience our meekness. They need to look at us and say, I want to be like that. I want to be able to give myself over to God and let him take control of all things. And and I realized that my sermon's a little short today, but if I'd have thrown in another verse it'd have been too long. So so I but what I'm what I want to know is are you ready? If you haven't come to Jesus, are you ready? You have to make the commitment. Nobody can do it for you. You can't be saved because your parents are good people. You can't be saved because your children are good people. You can't be saved unless you ask God to save you. It's the only way. You have to take those steps. If you're ready to do that today, please come as we stand and sing.